Please welcome today's guest, Liz Peake, Fox News. Thaddeus McCotter, Freedom Asylum, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, Fox News, and the host of the John Bachelor Show, John Bachelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show at CPAC, the American Conservative Union in Washington, D.C., on the border with Maryland. Actually, I'm a little lost, so I'm very <laughs> pleased to welcome my guests who know exactly where I am. Liz Peake of Fox News, Thaddeus McCotter, WJR, and Sebastian Gorka of Fox News. <clears throat> Our topic is the strength of the Republican Party here at the beginning of 2018, a midterm election year, always keen on measuring ourselves. So we begin, Liz, with the economy. In these last days, we've had polls showing that the American people, despite the efforts of the quarrelsome crowd, now enjoy the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act passed in 2017. That significant fact joins with the observation from all metrics, quite independent, that the markets have turned positive, very positive, on the future of the United States, Wall Street and Main Street. What supports this being sustained, Liz? What is the significance to you, and how do you connect that to the Republican Party? Good evening. Good evening, John. Thank you. Um, I think the most telling poll that's come out is that now 51% of the country actually approves of a tax cut that ta cuts taxes for 85% of the country. The most amazing thing the Democrats have accomplished in the last year is convincing most Americans that they were not going to see their taxes go down and that this is a bill that they should hate. Uh, it, it's really a remarkable accomplishment in terms of messaging, but now Americans are beginning to warm up to this. Uh, and in addition, we have a booming economy. So this is feeding that economy, as is the lightning of regulation that has been put in place by the White House. So we have two very formidable add-ons to an already growing economy. Uh, now the growth rate this year is expected to be anywhere from three to three and a half percent. The economists I follow most closely on Wall Street are now talking three and a half percent. Uh, and that looks sustainable because for the first time in eight years, we have businesses investing in America. And I think that is something that uh, is incredibly formative for the next couple of years. Productivity has been flat almost over the last decade. Uh, under Obama, businesses were so worried about increased regulation, higher taxes, uncertainty on all fronts that no one spent money on capital goods, so you didn't see any increase in productivity. So we have sort of a virtuous circle here, enormous confidence. Uh, the latest reading from small business owners, a record high level of confidence in the economy. Best time ever to invest, they responded to a survey. These are remarkable readings uh, of the economy, and I think the GOP uh, the reason that their polling is getting better and Trump's polling is getting better is partly because people are increasingly comfortable and optimistic about the economy. That is, your state of Michigan is one of the three states that surprised the world in the election of November 2016. Do you see it on Main Street? Do you see it in Detroit, the improving economy? Well, we see an improving economy, but the fundamental reason that people start to like the tax bill is because they understand that Happiness begins around the hearth of home. What the Republican Party did, what President Trump did, was by allowing people to keep their own money, by allowing them to make their own decisions, to make their own investments, by allowing businesses to invest in their most precious resource, which is their people, their human employees, has allowed this economy to grow and to continue to grow. And it shows that the suffocating bureaucracy, which the Democrats want to put on top of American prosperity, can be removed, can be shattered, and can unleash a tsunami of economic prosperity started with and driven by the American people. I use driven because it's a Detroit car reference. Yeah, so no, very nice. Now, uh, Macomb County is especially critical to the success of the president in 2016. 
Macomb County in particular, you know it very well, does it see an increase in jobs? Does it see a stronger economy? We always see it. We get sicker quicker. We get better later after, because we're a manufacturing state. But when you look at it, Michigan's happy when it's making things, when it's being productive. And don't forget that the president's position on getting American manufacturing jobs back in Michigan is something that resonates not only in Michigan but throughout the Midwest and also helps to undergird their confidence in this economic recovery it isn't simply Wall Street making money, it isn't simply the Dow Jones, it is people being put back to work to make things to continue to make America great again and, and to sell a few cars in Detroit. Seb, I'm calling upon you to help us understand how Washington doesn't get this. <laughs> You're here all the time. You have observed this from the White House and now from Fox News. What that is saying and what Liz is reporting from New York is common sense to us. We see it all the time. Mm. Is Washington deaf? Why isn't that message getting through to Capitol Hill and to the lobbyists here? Well, there's two audiences in Washington, I think, that apply to that question. There's the GOP establishment audience, and then there's the DNC and the Democrats. Uh, the GOP is starting to understand that this president was only accidentally the GOP candidate. He was the rank outsider. He owed nothing to the swamp. And they're starting to understand that he won despite the right-wing establishment, not because of it. And they're riding his coattails. And I think that's going to be you know, the effect in, in November. For the Democrats, John, I have no answer for you. <laughs> because Make America Great Again is a great slogan to win an election. Right. Uh, now it's actually being unpacked, and Thaddeus has unpacked some of it, and, uh, as ha has Liz. What does it mean? I tell everybody who asks me, what's the president really like? And I say very easy. The president wants all Americans to be safe and to prosper, whether or not you voted for him. I mean, this, this is the map. Whether you voted for Hillary, whether you voted for whether you wanted Bernie to be the candidate, it's irrelevant to him. So it's safety and prosperity, which, funnily enough, is a rather conservative concept, isn't it, John? We've heard that yes, before. Yes, we popular have. Popular too. Yes, rather. Po <laughs> what, what are you going to argue against? Is the DNC? We don't want to be exactly. safe, and we don't want prosperity because that's what they've blocked themselves into a corner in the last year with. Liz, secular stagnation. Where did it go? Larry Summers was just here preaching secular stagnation. Uh, he convinced the street. He convinced the major voices in New York that we were only going to grow at 2% forever yeah. and that the idea of 3 and 4% was a fairy tale. What happened? Well, he's still out there writing op-eds about how we can only grow at 2% even though we are actually growing at 3%. Uh, and the, the thinking is that there's a limited amount of labor available. But again, that ties into this whole productivity issue. Labor supply is not going to be a problem, is not going to lead to booming wages, although wages are starting to climb, which, by the way, was something Trump wanted to see happen and the country wanted to see happen. Uh, but the, it, the issue, again, is productivity. If you don't invest in new plants and new equipment, automated this and so forth, artificial intelligence, you are not going to see a climbing uh, productivity number, and indeed then labor becomes a constraint. But I think they're, they're looking back over their shoulder and saying, here's why we failed to grow the economy. And we, we want this failure to be understood in, as something that now cannot be reversed. It is being reversed, and I think it's really the greatest thing that this Republican administration has going for it. That is, you're a recovering politician, so I ask you to help us understand how this message is being heard by your colleagues on the Hill, especially the Republicans. Mr. Ryan and the leadership certainly passed the, jobs act, the tax cut and jobs act, but there's always hesitation. The Republicans aren't happy with good news. Are they hearing this good news? Or are they, are they regretful of what they've done? No, I don't think they regret it. I don't think they do. But what you have to understand is when people are out there getting employed, they're working, they're doing things, uh, they don't have time to go to town halls and throw chairs at you or <laughs> curse the president. As a recovering politician, I've got a lot of time to do that myself, although I like the president. So what you have to do is, especially to the people here tonight or the people who listen to the show, is make sure your members know that you appreciate what they're doing. Make sure they see that the efforts that you've put in to stand up to the left, to stand up to Crumbs Pelosi, to do the right thing for the American people, that you're appreciative of it and you're working on it and you want to see them go back. Because as Seb has pointed out, as Liz points out, what do the Democrats have? 
What do the Democrats have economically as a policy, not a talking point, but as a policy to go beyond 3% growth, to go beyond that 2% that the clowns talk about in the New York Times, the underestimation of the American entrepreneur? What are they going to offer you to make things better than they already are? Republicans are already working on plans to make it even better. What do they got? Nothing to spare. Remember, Hillary even came out against the gig economy, so to speak. So talk about a line that fell flat with millennials. I mean, the millennial generation is all about these sort of startup ventures, et cetera, a lot of them being gig economy. That was, I think, one of the worst moves she made during her entire campaign. It's a long list. This is the John Batchelor Show. Uh, we're at the American Conservative Union CPAC 2018. And we're speaking of the strength of the Republican Party. Seb has already pointed to where we're going. It's peace and prosperity. The next conversation is about ISIS. I'm John Batchelor. <laughs> this is the John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I am at the American Conservative Union CPAC 2018. Quite irregularly, I'm doing this radio show on stage, but I'm dealing with people who are very happy and comfortable with all the time to measure the strength of the Republican Party. That is McCotter, Liz Peek, and Sebastian Gorka. Seb, peace and prosperity. That's what re-elected Ike in 1956. It what, it's what makes the Republican Party strong in the second part of the 20th century, because they, they, spent, the, they spent the first part, half of the 20th century uh, dealing with the New Deal. But in the second half, peace and prosperity. Seb, this is a hard question. I've been looking for days. Where's ISIS? What <laughs> happened? It's, How did it go away? It's not on the agenda. Nobody is talking about it. Isn't it remarkable? Uh, especially if we recall that for the longest time, the last president told us this is a generational threat, meaning your children, our grandchildren, will be fighting the ISIS jihadis. Uh, decades from now. And what happened? We have a new president who seems to have compressed a generation down into six months. So why, why is that? And, and here I must give credit where credit is due. Number one, the president trusts our military and allows them to do their job, which is a refreshing concept after the last eight years. Uh, secondly, um, we have the best military in the world. So when you let them do their job, they will crush our enemies. But Lastly, and, and here, you know, credit is due. Steve Bannon, as the president's chief strategist, I was the strategist, he was the chief strategist, said, I want a bumper sticker for the next three months, and it's going to be no more physical caliphate. The physical caliphate, which is what makes ISIS remarkable, because they're the first jihadi group since the last caliphate was dissolved to reestablish one, we have to obliterate it. What did the president and the American armed forces do? In a matter of three months, took back Raqqa, Mosul, and destroyed ISIS's physical caliphate. That's why we're not talking about them, and that's why we're safer, with one caveat. They don't disappear. They're looking for more fertile grounds elsewhere, probably Africa, but we'll deal with them there as well. So leadership brings results. It's that simple, John. Liz, the national security question also deals with our allies in Europe, our reluctant allies in Europe and NATO's um, geriatric state until along came President Trump. We don't feel it in New York. We can't sense in New York whether NATO's paying attention or not. But the metrics demonstrate that the US is putting pressure on NATO to respond and putting pressure on its countries to respond. I think, Liz and I are in New York all the time. I think often, Liz, the fact that we don't talk about it means that it's going better. <laughs> Maybe. Look, I think that uh, President Trump had a very realistic and common sense approach to our relationship with NATO, which is we all need to do our fair share. Uh, the fair share, you know, words are pretty popular on the left until it came to this particular discussion. Uh, but it seems to me, for example, when President Trump came out uh, and, and at some length berated our NATO allies for not living up to their agreement to spend 2% of GDP on armaments and on defense, I thought he was totally reasonable. And I think most Americans feel like, yes, we are shouldering too much of the responsibility here. I just looked at these numbers very recently. Germany, which has a huge trade, trade surplus, is incredibly wealthy, 
uh, country is still not paying 2% uh, on their own defense. And I think, you know, most people are sort of thinking, why should that be? So, uh, you know, one of the things that the left was so alarmed about was that Trump was going to pull us out of the NATO agreement. I don't think that's anywhere on the horizon, but I think he does expect our allies to, to basically live up to their agreements. That is. Moscow and Beijing are threats to the American people. Do the American people know it? Well, I think the American people know it. It's whether or not the American cognoscenti <laughs> in foreign policy understand it. Look, just as it was at the beginning of the 20th century, it is today. You have America and her allies believe that liberty undergirds security and prosperity. As rival models of governance, Putin's autocratic kleptocracy in Russia and the communist Beijing regime believe that liberty is the enemy of prosperity and security. Therefore, the race is between the United States and her allies and communist and authoritarian countries for the future of other countries that are developing to see which way to go. And in that, President Trump understands by making America great again, that is not just simply a self-indulgent project of the American people. What it is is it unleashes liberty, puts it on display, and we show the world what a free people can achieve and inspire them to get on board as our allies and show that the future belongs to free people. The Indo-Pacific region is the challenge of the 21st century. The president has led an initiative to create something we can call a coalition. It's called a quad. India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. Seb, I want to come to you on this specifically. That creation is entirely a product of the Trump administration. That did not exist. Um, Mr. The previous administration had a, what you'd have to say, unknown relationship with China, unknown. Did not see it as a threat, hence we lost major pieces of the South China Sea to China's aggression. This administration sees it. Are we going to stand up for ourselves, Seb? Absolutely. The fact the president launched a 302 investigation against the trade practices of China is a, is a historic act. And they always say that candidates don't really realize the enormity of what they're getting into until that first day after the inauguration and they get the full presidential daily brief. I can assure you, uh, and this was uh, for me also a personal falling off the scales from my eyes, the president attitude to China changed as soon as he became the president because he had a very businessman-like attitude. Well, their money is green, so their investment must be good for America. He now understands, thanks to those briefings, that there's only one strategic threat America faces. It's not ISIS. ISIS is not a strategic threat, nor is North Korea, nor is Russia. Russia's GDP is smaller than California's. They're losing a half a million people per year are dying in Russia more than are being born. These aren't strategic level threats. The only one we face is China. China is at war with us already, not with battle carrier groups, but with its economic warfare, its political warfare. Look at what Australia has gone through with literally the purchasing of politicians with Chinese cash to distort their democracy. These are facts. So the president has turned the world around, not only American understanding inside the administration, but our friends in that Pacific, Asia Pacific region realize American leadership is back. We're not going to go to war with China kinetically, but we're not going to allow them to execute their one belt, one road plan for hegemonic domination. Not going to happen under Donald Trump's watch. This is the John Batchelor Show. We're at the American Conservative Union, CPAC 2018. We're discussing the strength of the Republican Party in 2018. It is not something you see in the headlines of the Washington Post or the New York Times, nor is what you hear on the national networks. It is true, however, that the strength of the Republican Party depends upon dealing with a current event that is non-transparent, that is generally understood as Russiagate, and we'll turn to that when we come back. I'm John Batchelor with Thaddeus McCotter, Liz Peake, and Sebastian Gorka. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show at the American Conservative Union, CPAC 2018. We're discussing the strength of the Republican Party, and we've talked of the economy and the tax cut and the growth that was denied by the previous administration. We've talked of prosperity. ISIS has disappeared from the conversation. Russia and China are challenged directly. No longer is there diplomacy around the edges as if we can get along. We cannot get along with tyrannies. However, there is a subject that comes up all the time, and I want to deal with it here. 
It's called Russiagate in general. My opinion, it is a product of an allegation by the Hillary Clinton campaign and the DNC to accuse a candidate for the presidency, a president-elect, and a president of colluding with our enemies, colluding for money, colluding because of blackmail. It is a fantastic and false accusation based upon rubbish called the Steele dossier. And yet, we have today a special counsel doing his business as if he's going to discover the secret door to this conspiracy. I want to begin with you, Liz, because you and I talk about this now and again and the frustration of us watching it from New York. Your opinion, is this a Washington matter that only Washington people can understand? Because it makes no sense to us in New York, week after week, the idea that in some fashion there's going to be a revelation that tears Donald Trump from the presidency and restores the kingdom. Well, by the way, I think the rest of the country is wondering what the heck is going on because this investigation has been going on for almost a year uh, and there is absolutely no evidence that anyone in the Trump uh, campaign or administration colluded with Russia uh, in any way. And so I think it is not only, it, frankly, Americans' uh, attention span is such that people have really tuned out of this. Now, unfortunately, what's happening, and I think this is a tragedy, is our FBI, our law enforcement uh, administration, and the Justice Department are under a serious cloud because it really does look like, yes, there was collusion. The collusion was between Democrats running for office and the FBI. And that, to me, is an absolutely horrible revelation. And I think that's where we're going with this whole investigation of how this warrant uh, was uh, obtained by the Justice Department. The Department. Carter Page warrant that's of right. October 21st, 2016. So, uh, I, I, Thaddeus, I turn to you because as a recovering politician, I ask your help here to understand how this is viewed on Capitol Hill. On the one hand, for the Republicans, it's a distraction and annoying always to lose out to these headlines. On the other hand, it certainly is good for committees to have the fate of the nation turn on the, the next testimony <laughs> or the next revelation. So how do politicians cynically and commonsensically regard Russiagate? Well, you pretty much analyze the cynical part already. And if you don't know what a cynical politician looks like talking about Russiagate, just watch Adam Schiff or Swalwell on TV. Although, in fairness, I don't think many of you would watch those stations. <laughs> the good thing about this is, and I believe from what we've seen and what we will continue to see come out, is you're going to see the police powers of the state and the intelligence agencies weaponized against people's political opponents for partisan gain. That is bigger than Watergate. That is a betrayal of the oath to the United States, and that's going to come out. And we are very lucky that Devin Nunes, Grassley, Graham, and Goodlatte do not take the cynical attitude to this and are doing what's in the best interest of the American people. Okay. And will continue to do so, despite the swamp. I'm very glad you mentioned uh, Chairman Nunes. Uh, Thaddeus and I disclose this all the time. We're very good colleagues with Devin Nunes. Never Thaddeus heard of the man. Introduced Never heard of the man. Me, Thaddeus introduced <laughs> me to Devin many years ago when he was in leadership in the House. And uh, today, Thaddeus and I enjoy uh, the information that we get from the House Intelligence Committee. We enjoy the contest the House Intelligence Committee has made of Russiagate. And we look forward to more. He's a very strong very confident chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and we're very lucky to have him. But Seb, I go to you, because what we see from the so-called Nunes memo, which is really the memo of the House majority of the intelligence, what we see from Senator Grassley and Senator Graham in their letter to the Department of Justice making a criminal referral on Christopher Steele, what we see in there uh, are, is the outlines of bad actors mm -hmm. who were not only Democrats, but were part of the previous administration. Mm -hmm. Now, Seb, we understand that we need the FBI and we need the Department of Justice and we need the executive branch to work and function. Mm -hmm. However, the outline suggests that we're going to spend a nightmare ahead of us finding, finding the truth here. Can Washington handle this? Can we both protect the American people and provide for prosperity and seek out the bad actors um, who are outlined in those documents? If you have a very serious illness, sometimes you just have to take the chemo. 
and we have a very serious problem because to summarize all the scandal down to its most trenchant point, last year or during the end of the presidential election, we had one candidate and her party basically buy an illegal surveillance warrant against a member of the other candidate's team. That's what happened in America. Through their connections, through the political appointees, the Department of Justice, the FBI, they got the permission from a judge to spy on another American in a way that was illegal, hiding exculpatory information from that warrant application. That's political police. You're not allowed to spy on somebody for political reasons. That's something we have to get to the bottom of having the contacts you have, knowing the people on the Hill, the great individuals who really are exercising their oversight duties. Finally, Congress is exercising their oversight duties. It is clear this is the beginning. What we know is just the fraction. And I think beyond the Steele dossier, which is an outrage to begin with, there is an even larger scandal that will be unearthed, and that is the unmaskings. When you have a UN ambassador requesting 200 unmaskings of US citizens. She's not even part of the intelligence community. What are we talking about? That's the Obama administration, and we have to get to the bottom of it. John, whatever the cost. Uh, uh, the cost is high, Liz. The cost is very high. Cost this is, is going to disrupt the markets. It's going to disrupt the economy. Uh, if I understand the scale of this, we're talking about the major leaders of the previous administration. I, I, I agree if we actually get to that point, it would be very disruptive. But I do wonder whether there's an appetite to carry it to its final conclusion. Um, I hope so, because I think these people really misbehaved, and I think it's time that they were called out on it. And frankly, <laughs> uh, I, al I also... I also want to see the media start to cover this story, because I think we all know that the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, they have assiduously avoided covering the story. And I think that is really bad news. Um, and, and it has to be fixed. That is the ad hominem on Devin Nunes, the ad hominem on anyone who speaks out for the facts of the revelations about the Steele dossier. The ad hominems are detestable. How do politicians hear that? When they're attacked daily, their persons are attacked, their families are threatened, their, their, their movement is limited because they're seeking to find the facts. That's their responsibility. How do they, do they think that, that, do you think this is part of the job? Do you think this isn't worth it? I'm not paid well enough? What's the, what, what happens? No, especially in the case of Comrade Nunes, whoops, and others, what you wind up with is you have an elected official who understands the oath that he or she took and that they're going to get to the bottom of this because what has happened is wrong. And so you just shut out the noise. And as Devin has said himself, you know you're over the target when you take the most flack. Yeah. So the more they try to attack the messenger, the more they try to smear him, the more they try to intimidate other members against us, like Trey Gowdy and others, all that tells you is they can't defend the indefensible. They can't defend the proposition or the allegation a fact of what they've done, so they attack the messenger. And that's what you're continuing to see. And you'll continue to see this because there's no defense for what they did. And the people who are investigating this have long ago made the determination when they first sought office and then took that oath that things like this were things they were going to get to the bottom of, regardless of whichever party it hurt, because it's wrong. Uh, one more detail, one more detail here. I want to emphasize this because it's what we talk about all the time. We're very early into this process, very early. Those who want to rush this are uninformed. And those who know what's going on or have an understanding of understanding, this is going to take much longer than this election cycle. And yet, and I have to, we have to do this, impeachment, Seth, for heaven's sakes, impeachment. It's the democratic theme. It's it, what they have. It's with. all they have. It's, it's all they have, and, and, and it's absurd. And I hold you responsible for Washington. What the <laughs> heck is going on? When, is... when you have no platform, John, you clutch in desperation. Uh, literally on policies, what can they appeal to? We don't want Americans to be safe and we don't want you to prosper. Well, Nancy Pelosi probably realizes she can't campaign on that. So what's left? It's the crazies. It's the let's impeach him. But if they go down that avenue, I have a word of warning for them. They have no idea who they're dealing with. 
The idea of impeaching Donald Trump, this is a man who never gives up. And you know what? He will be outflanking them on Twitter every day, multiple times, and they will go down for the parody that they are. So really, it's desperation. But Liz, I, I Liz, also yeah. was, I, I think that's right. And I also think there is this so-called enthusiasm gap. Um, the left is very fired up to go and campaign against Donald Trump. They want to see impeachment. But I think on the right, I mean, it's, it's generally the case that, that the incumbent uh, party loses seats in the House. This is a very motivating issue. I hope everyone in this room and all the people you know are going to remember that this impeachment threat is out there. And it's a very good reason to give money and to go vote and to stir up all your neighbors and get them to vote too. Uh, again, I go back to the, the, the cynical side of being a politician. That is, <laughs> thanks, thanks. If, the Democrats, if the Democrats have their dream and win majority control of the House of Representatives, they will move. They promised us. They've even named their leadership to impeach the president. My observation is that that will re-elect Donald J. Trump by about 400 electoral votes. <laughs> well, could be. Look, fundamentally, it, it's they, the Democrats, and I, I hate to give them constructive advice. Yeah, so. Fortunately, they'll ignore it. So <laughs> when you look at it, we went through this with, when George Bush was president. There was Bush derangement syndrome. I remember when President Obama was there. You know, people would ask us all the time, well, you want President Obama to fail? And I'd say, no, I'm trying to give him constructive criticism to make things better for the American people. Whether he takes it or not is fine, and then you put it out. Because the way Americans view real life is, look, you're a Democrat, you may hate Donald Trump, but what are you doing for me, baby? What are you doing for me and mine? Other than hating Trump, because that ain't getting me nowhere. That's not getting me a job. It's not getting me a new car. It's not getting my kids in college. It's not keeping me safe and secure. So if you want to hate Trump, knock yourself out. But what are you doing for me? And all you hear out of them is, well, I'm hating Trump more. And Russia. This is the John Batchelor Show. I'm with Sebastian Gorka, Liz Peek, and Thaddeus McCotter were discussing the strength of the Republican Party. And when we come back, the strength of the Republican Party for our children, the millennials. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I'm at the American Conservative Union CPAC 2018. And I'm on stage with Liz Peek, Sebastian Gorka, and Thaddeus McCotter. We've discussed the larger themes for the Republican strength. But now we look to the future, the millennials. We are, those of us who are lucky enough to have children who are millennials, we understand that we're dad and mom and therefore, okay. <laughs> but, but we think about what they're going to remember. They're the institutional memory for what we're struggling with right now. So Liz, I want to start with you because you have, you have elderly millennials and also uh, bridging the gap here. You can see the millennials around you in, in New York. We are told that, that the millennials, millennials are keen on Barack Obama, keen on the Democratic Party. And yet at the same time, uh, at least the millennials I know, which are my children, they've all got 401ks. The idea of me in 1969 having a 401k, I would have been drummed out of the boomers, absolutely asked to leave, but they've got 401ks. Is that going to bring them back to common sense? Look, I think this is a teaching moment for millennials, right? The teaching moment is, guess what? You lower taxes, you lighten the regulatory burden, and the economy is unshackled and begins to grow, and that's good for everybody. And I think after eight years of living in their parents' garage or whatever, this is a, an awakening. Uh, I, I'm, I think it's an incredibly exciting thing and it's, it, because we haven't had this kind of dialogue uh, in a long time. So they all learn from their economics professors that... Uh, you know, Keynesian economics does this and that and so forth. They did not learn about Art Laffer and the Laffer curve. Uh, we're kind of having that replayed before us now, and I think it's really an incredible good time for them to learn a great deal about how so the world works. So they're listening. They're listening. Yeah, they're watching it. They're, they're, I mean, not, they're not just listening. Yeah, they're, they're living they're it. They're doing it. Exactly. I mean, this, is, this is the fascinating thing about my, my children are millennials. Look at the internet. We hear all the things about Twitter is quietly censoring conservatives. Who's, who is most active on the internet when it comes to young politi political products? It's not the left. I mean, if you look at what's the Ben Shapiro's of the world, the Turning Point USA, the Charlie Kirk's, the CJ Pearson's, these are all hardcore conservatives. And it's not a message of, of hatred. 
It's a message of prosperity and safety. So we have a very interesting moment here where the conservative movement is still trying to define what Trumpism is. I mean, you know, the, the op-ed writers are still trying to define what Trump, Trumpism is. The millennials are doing it without reading National Review, without reading the op-ed pages of the Washington Times. You know, I myself, I'm not a millennial. I had to do it as well. I said, okay, let's do a video cast every day, Rebel TV. I have to have that audience understand what I understood from my parents who escaped communism. This is a fight you have to fight every 20 years. John, we thought we'd won this. November the 9th, 1989, stake through the heart of communism, right? We, we, we're fighting the same argument. Laffer curve. Why are we discussing the Laffer curve in 2018? It should be in every textbook in America. Right, and it isn't. And it isn't. <laughs> so it's exciting things are happening, Jean. Uh, Thaddeus, the millennials, they do care about social issues, but they don't talk about them first. Are there social issues that the Republicans need to be more responsive to? Well, first, I think you're underestimating millennials. Now, I'm not an aging hipster by any chance, but I am Gen X. So I've got to watch millennials, my children. And what you see in the studies are their positions stack up with Republican positions, especially on economic issues. They're very entrepreneurial. They're very creative. If anything, they tend to be more libertarian on the social issues than anything else. As for pro-life, I think we continue to see that life, the support for life continues to grow, especially when technology shows us that children can live at the age of 21 weeks. And you see the ultrasounds. Eventually, we're going to get there. But when you look at the millennials, the worst thing you want to do with any type of voter is look at them like, well, you're a millennial. It's like, no, it's an individual. Right. And so you put it forward to the individual. And what you'll see is these millennials will start to understand what works. Look, I was born, my father was an Irish Catholic Democrat, my mother was a, was a moderate Republican, but I saw Reagan, I saw it worked. And I got to vote for him in 84, and I did. And I've been a Republican ever since. What works, works. And for the millennials who live in a period of time where they have more ability from the communication revolution to be heard, to shape their own destinies in their hands on a laptop or a phone, are not going to want the government to run their lives for them in the long run. The, the passion of youth will ebb, reality will set in, and you'll realize that, you know, those cats in 1776 and on, they got it right. Liberty <laughs> is the wave of the future, and totalitarianism and Weberian bureaucracy from the 19th century is not progressive, it is regressive, and I don't want any part of that. And that's what's going to happen. It's going to happen. My generation did it. They will, too. We don't have Hollywood. We don't have television. We don't have the Washington Post. We don't have the New York Times. We don't have two of the big cables. We don't have all of that, and yet still they're going to listen to us. Seb? Look, uh, the President of the United States has 48 million Twitter followers. <laughs> That's just Twitter. 48 million. It's, uh, I only get recognized as a Fox News figure at events like these by people over the age of 40. Everybody younger than 40 has no idea who I am. Why is that? Because they don't watch television, but they're watching other millennials doing three-minute podcasts every day. This is what's happening. This is what, how we have to engage. And guess what? A lot of those people like the common sense attitude of the president. The president is two things, a patriot and a pragmatist. Yes. And that pragmatism cannot be denied, and even millennials can see that. And Thaddeus is absolutely right. This isn't an age group. This isn't an age cohort. These are Americans, and let's treat them as individuals. Yeah. We've got, we've got uh, 30 seconds. So I'm, I'm going to wrap this up by thanking all three of you for making this effort to come to me on stage. It's a whole lot easier when we do it on the telephone. <laughs> a, a whole lot easier. Less makeup. Yeah, less makeup. But it's a pleasure to sit with you. It's kind of like television, I guess, <laughs> except for we don't have four-minute bites. You know, we can talk. So I thank you very much, Liz, for thank coming. You. I thank you, Thaddeus, for coming from Michigan. And Seb, I, I apologize for holding you responsible for Washington. Yeah, that's fine. I just live in the swamp. I'm not the swamp. <laughs> this is the John Batchelor Show at the American Conservative Union, CPAC 2018, and I thank everyone. I'm John Batchelor.